Welcome back to the Impact Driven Leader Podcast. This is your host, Tyler Dinkerhoff. Excited to be here with you. Man, we're wrapping up 2022, um, almost to our 100th episode. Those episodes will actually release in the next couple of weeks. We're actually going to have a compilation of some of the most downloaded episodes of the Impact Driven Leader Podcast. Excited to re-release those and really use them as a spotlight for some of the great value that uh, all the guests have shared in the last couple of years. No less value in this episode, author, speaker first, um, just a wonderful dude. Ryan Leak joins me today. We talk all about smiling. Yeah, smiling, body language. You know, the effect that that has on those that you lead. We dip into his book, Leveling Up, which released on December 6th, just a couple days ago. He also shares a little bit about his uh, brand new course, The Art of Self-Leadership. Man, I'm excited for you to hear this conversation. And, and Ryan talks about chasing failure. We talk about why and a lot of people today struggle with saying, I need to grow up. And what key component they need from their leader to embrace, I can grow and I can get better. Make sure you take some notes. Again, thanks for being here. I'll wrap up at the end and, and share a few other key things. Yeah. Ryan, good to see you, man. That good smile well. is, is just electric. I'm excited <laughs> to see it. <laughs> you know what? It's interesting. Whenever I am recording things these days, um, I, I'll actually write the word smile in between paragraphs. Okay. It, so, it's amazing uh, how much of uh, like whenever uh, speakers ask me to review something for them, I'll watch it on mute. Uh -huh. it, ain't, it ain't even about what's coming out of your mouth. To me, it's wow. like, it's amazing. Like what a smile really does for you just about anything. So like, I, I just, I've just learned to like, man, like sometimes things are just really tough. Hey man, smile. It's amazing uh -huh. how it like, how it impacts everything else. We could spend the, the allotted time that we have just digging that apart. Um, oh, yeah. Well, it, and partly because, um, so one of my beliefs, and I'll, I'll share this, this is kind of a, uh, one of my beliefs is that a barrier in leadership is intensity. A yeah. person's intensity is their barrier to be able to lead themselves and others. And I yeah. had somebody ask me recently, it's like, Tyler, you're an intense person. I said, yes, I know. That's why I know it's a barrier. And they're like, well, how do you work through that? And I said, I smile. Yeah. And I realized that a smile kind of diffuses whatever tension there is because you just, just relax, just smile. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I'm with why, you 100%. Did, why did you write that down? What made you think about that? Man, I think there were times where as a leader, you have to give hard truths. Mm. You have to have tough conversations and as a speaker, I also have to say tough things, especially to leaders that a lot of times leaders don't want to hear. And there's some times where I would even watch myself speak and I'm like, you look mad. I, mean, I know you're not mad, but you're sharing something that is like, that you're passionate about. And sometimes when you get passion on your face, you get this like, mm, and it's like, but I, I just, man, I, I think that when you, when you put a smile on your face, it's not a fake thing. It's, it's going, I think what tough love with a smile communicates is I love you enough to tell you the truth. Oh, that's I think that's what, I think there's this, I'm not, it's isn't personal. I'm, I'm not mad at you. I, I, I want you to grow perhaps more than you do. Mm-hmm. And so I think uh, when you, when you're able to say tough things with a smile, you're, you're communicating way beyond what you're actually saying. And so that's why I, I think it's important in any kind of communication because leadership, you know, it's going to be very, very difficult to lead without, without a high level of communication. And most of what we are communicating is with our body. Hey, so I agree with that completely. And, and I think that's, that's something that we, we lose sight of. Yeah. And yet, like you, you know, just mentioned there is watching someone and putting on mute and just watching their body that will oh, tell yeah. you everything. Or even if you're so oh, far yeah. away, say you're in a position and you can watch somebody, but from yeah. afar 
and you're just yeah. watching them and you're like, oh, I know what's going on because their body's telling yeah. the whole story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, 100%. And I think if you are, whether you're giving someone correction or tough love, or if you're asking your team to do something that is tough to pull off, to be able to ask and make a request that is beyond the norm with a smile on your face, you'd be surprised how many people will go. I know I don't have to do that, but okay. Yeah. It's, I'll, I'll, I'll go the extra mile. It's authentic vulnerability. Yeah. Um, one of our mutual friends, Brad Lominick, he shared with me, this with me years ago. And, and yeah. I hold on to it still every day. And at that point, he goes, you know, the change in the CEO of the past, the CEO of the future is the one that stands in front of the room, throws their arms in the air, shows their sweaty pits and say, I don't have all the answers, but yeah. this room, we can figure it out. And compared to the, the person who's standing there in their, you know, starch suit and, you know, shirt and just everything is tailored to perfect and perfect hair. And they're like, I'm robotic and I have this. And like, yeah. no one wants to follow that person. Nobody. Nah, no. And, to me that, you know, as I think more about this is like, it's pretty hard to be robotic and have a genuine heartfelt smile. Like yeah. you can fake a smile. You know, you think about, you know, all sure. those movies, the, the fake sure. robots and they're smiling. It's like, you could tell it's not real. Right. right, For sure. And I think, you know, as you talk about that and remind yourself, just, just be real, just yeah. smile. Yeah. Huh. And I, I often think too, man, there's a lot to smile about. Yeah. There's, there's, there's like. I consistently think of things that just, just make me laugh. You know, I, I will find people in the audience that I just, I just think, man, that's a, it's a very interesting shirt combo <laughs> you have there with those. And I just, and then I'll just like kind of gravitate towards that part of the room for like the next hour. And every time I go with it, I just smile. I just, I don't yeah. know. I, 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 I look, I look for things that are, are joyful. So um, you mentioned this that, you know, before you, you have another book coming out, which we're yeah. going to talk a little bit about here at some yeah. point, leveling up. You've written, um, you know, other work, pieces of work, but you said, no, I'm a speaker. Yeah. So why is it that you say, no, I'm a speaker. I'm not an author. I'm not this or that. I'm a speaker. Yeah. I would say I'm a speaker first, okay. not an author yeah. first. Yeah, and, and the difference is, is like there are authors who like this is all they do. They eat, sleep, drink, writing, and selling books. Like that. That's that's their world. It's a part of my world, but it's not my world. Does that makes yeah. sense. Like at the yeah. end of the day, my greatest tool to be able to inspire people is with a microphone. And part of that is, it is for me way more difficult to help someone else smile through written words than if you give me a microphone. You, you put me in front of any audience, I will make them smile. Guarantee it, like with confidence. Like in my book, there are stories that I tell that are great stories, but it can't tell the story better than me in person live mm -hmm. like that's the craft that i am chiseling and working on every single day now to be able to speak you have to be a good writer as well mm -hmm. but the the art form of writing great books for the long run of you know i i don't see in my career going oh man i'm gonna have 100 books that i wrote probably not i have over 500 talks that I've written that easily could be turned into books, but it's just like, that's not, that's not my forte or, yeah. or my lane. Like I absolutely love the art of verbal public communication to me. Like that's the field that I thrive in the most. So as a son of a pastor, you saw yeah. obviously that modeled at a very young age. Yeah. You know, obviously that's, that's what pastors do. That's what, yeah. you know, that field, how did, why did you decide, oh, that's what's, this is what's going to help me serve people. You know, it, it's a, I've had many jobs in my, 
in my lifetime, you know, from, I, I saw there was a, there was a, a piece there where you, you had a, a stint at finish line. Yeah. Oh yeah. Finish yeah. line express. Okay. Best buy Verizon. You've T-Mobile. done the whole retail space. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I know them all very well. I, I just found that where I could add the most value to people's lives was with the microphone. I've been on executive teams. I've done leadership development, uh, do executive coaching now through my company. And all of that's wonderful and dandy, you know, cause, but I have found that I have gotten the most emails, text messages, phone calls when I have a microphone in my hand by, by, by far. So for me, it's like, I think that that is the way that I, I feel like I can make a difference in the world. And sometimes it's not always a microphone. Sometimes it's even just creating a piece of content on social media sure. that can make that same kind of same kind of impact. But I, I can prepare for a post the same way I would prepare for an event. You know, I think the same, hey, what's something that can add value to other people's lives that can encourage them, that can inspire them to be better today? And so, so then, you know, I, I round up the squad and say, hey, let's create some fun stuff today. Yeah. So the, to me, there, there had to be a point where the, either there was someone that, that modeled that for you or inspired that out of you to realize that, oh, they either saw belief that you were able to do it or, or some yeah. way along the line, you're like, okay, this is the way for me to really be impactful. Yeah. You know, it, it is, you know, my previous book is called Chasing Failure. Mm-hmm. And that's not a gimmick. That's not a, a a catchy phrase. That is my life. Every day, we are trying something brand new that could totally fail. We're just doing it. We're just... What I told a friend yesterday is I said the biggest... And, and he's, he's trying to get his speaking career off the ground. He's trying to figure out social media content and so on and so forth. And he's kind of overthought it. And I think a lot of people do. And I say, Hey man, the biggest difference between you and me, isn't talent. It's just that I'm willing to fail every day. And you're not, I'm willing to post something that doesn't go well. I'm, I'm willing to put myself out there. You're not, that's the only difference between, between you and me. And so people would be surprised how much of my career has truly been trial and error. (laughs) I was speaking at a church. My very first corporate gig, people go, man, when did you make the transition to corporate? Well, I didn't. <laughs> I was speaking at my church and an executive said, hey, that was really powerful. Would you come give that same speech at my job? Just don't use the verses. I said, sure. That's how I made, I didn't fully make the transition because I still have my, my foot in both. And yeah. I think both sides, corporate was like, come fully corporate and church is like, no, come full. They're, they're both like at this tug of war. And I'm just like, no, I'm just going to serve both because they got yeah. people in it with pain. And, and I think I got something to say that can, that can help them. And so I did that first corporate event and apparently it went well because they called their friends and I can't tell you how many fortune 500 company leaders have heard me speak in a church and have said, Hey, We just did our annual conference and Sunday was better than the convention center. So I don't know why we wouldn't have you as a speaker. I'm like, I don't know why you wouldn't have me as a speaker. (laughs) (laughs) So so it's, it's my business has grown it honestly in partnership with a lot of great church people that that's where they heard me first. Yeah. And the interesting part about that, is in church, I'm given subjects every week to write about. So I'm creating brand new content every single week, no matter what. So you have an executive who has not heard me speak once on a subject. They've heard me speak 20 times on multiple subjects. And for them, they're going, okay, if I heard Ryan speak 20 times, I'm willing to bet they'd say I probably hit 15 home runs on just random subjects. So now that executive is telling their company, 
hey, Ryan's a great speaker. And they say, well, what does Ryan speak about? And they go, ah, well, what do we want him to speak about? Like, what are the problems and challenges and pain points we're dealing with? And then they'll tell me, and I'll say, hey, can I write a talk on that for you? Like, well, you're just going to write it? And you're like, yeah, I mean, that, that's actually kind of what I do. And then mm -hmm. I'll write a new corporate talk, and then they'll call their friends and go, you got to have Ryan come talk on anger. I'm like, I'm not an anger specialist. Like, I don't do yeah. anger management. Like, it's the best talk I've heard on anger. I'm like, I don't know. I, yes, I can come do it. But remember, you asked me to do that. But now it's a new tool in my arsenal. So now I've got, like, 30 corporate talks that people can choose from. And, like, that's – so – as far as like a model, dude, I'm still figuring it out. Like I would love to convince people that like I arrived, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I wake up every day with a shovel and I'm trying to pave the way for, for some other people because mine, my path has been rather unconventional. Everywhere I go, I hear the phrase, that's not how it works. That's not how the industry works. That's not, I'm like, I know you're right. But I don't know why they keep making exceptions for me. So I've been told, hey, this person won't have you if they know you're a Christian. What am I supposed to do, lie? <laughs> yeah. What does that get you? Yeah, like what I'm, well, like, it, 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 it's, it, first off, it's a dumb lie. You, I, they got Google. <laughs> when you Google me, you will find a bunch of sermons as well. So it's like, like what, what do you want me to do? And so some of the places I was told I would never get to go, I keep getting invited back to speak. So yeah. I, I don't know. I just, I, I just, yeah. Here's the, you know, we could, again, I, I love this part of it. One, I do have notes. I do have like ideas. We haven't got to any of it. And to me, that's a valuable conversation sure. because of what you've shared. But I, I think of, of something there that you, you kind of tying two things together is we're all people. It doesn't matter if you sit in a church or sit in an office, we're people. all dealing with the same struggles and issues and whatever yeah. else. Number two is I believe the fact that you're willing to be, this is who I am is oh, yeah. actually so refreshing in the world. And it makes yeah. me think of, you know, um, I, I've seen this happen and, and I want to refer to it because I think it's, it's very connected is the fact that John Maxwell has been invited to sit down with the Saudi uh, Royal family. He's been invited to Iran. He's been invited to a lot of these countries and like, there's no mistake. Dude's a Jesus guy first, right? He is a pastor. That is where everything comes from. And yet because who he is and like authentic in that he's not one thing to one group and one thing to another group, they're like, right. okay, we understand what you are and we can okay. accept that I instead of like, we, when you look at someone and you're like, like there's someone very popular figure today. And I continually look at them and I'm like, I don't know who you are mm. because I hear one thing, but I see something totally different and it yeah. makes me uneasy sure. and it makes me personally very uneasy where I'm not sure. Can I really trust this person with my heart? Yeah. Yeah. And as we're, you know, discussing that from a leadership perspective, yeah. man, people struggle that every single day, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the uh, books that I quote in my book um, is by a guy named David Horsager. Mm -hmm. And the first line in his book is the question everyone is asking about you is, can I trust you? The trust of Can them. I trust you? And how authentic you are will determine the level of trust that people have for you. I was getting ready to speak for um, an insurance agency. One of the questions I always love to ask, like on a pre-event call is, uh, who have you had speak before? Uh, what's the worst mistake a speaker has ever made? One, I just like the stories. And B, <laughs> I want to make sure I don't do what they did. Yeah. And then I go, hey, who's the best speaker you've ever had? And this one insurance agency, they said, best speaker we've ever had, Doc Rivers. And I was like, okay. I mean, Doc Rivers, household name. Another Chicago hey, guy? I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. I said, well, what about him? And I know, you know, he's charismatic and he's pretty good with words. And so I'm like, but what, what made him stand out? And they used this word. They said, he was agendaless. He was agendaless. Here's the, here's the interesting thing about being agendaless. You can't prove it. You can just feel it. 
Mm-hmm. That's the superpower every follower has regarding their leader. They can feel when something's off. They can't prove if you're lying. They can't prove if you have an agenda, but they can feel it. And that that's the hard part about being a leader is being able to walk into a room and go, hey, here's all the cards on the table. Here's my agenda. I want us to grow and I want you to grow. Can't we do it together? Here's what's going to here's what's going to be required of me and you to pull that off. And to be able to do that with a pure heart, with high integrity, it's very, very difficult for a leader. I think it's, it, you know, while why that probably struck them so much so much is that's abnormal in our world yeah. and it's almost said that well you can't have success unless you have an agenda right and everyone's like you know what's your angle what's your agenda it's like yeah no i, I just <laughs> I, I just i just want to serve people like yeah. i find fulfillment in serving people so yeah. i'm not going to keep score i'm just gonna keep yeah. serving people in yeah i, I, I think, think leadership that- is is you, you, I say that I get to speak in almost every industry that exists. Finance. I spoke to farmers last week. Good. Now you're now you're talking my. See, yeah, I like, grew up on a farm. Yeah. yeah. Farmers, so, pharmaceutical. Yeah. Uh, finance, professional athlete. I, I tell every industry the same thing. It doesn't matter what your product is. We're all in the people business. Yep. All of us. Yeah. You. you Leader, you're 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 in the people business. It is the greatest component of leadership is is your people skills in in being able to relate to people and to be able to build culture around people is the, the greatest brands in the world don't have the greatest products. What they figured out is they, they have the greatest customer service. They have they have the greatest people skills. Like that's they have the greatest stories, like, right? Yeah, like if, if you compare Macy's to Nordstrom, does Nordstrom have better hangers? <laughs> the, you can get a Nike sweatshirt at Nordstrom, you can get a Nike sweatshirt at Macy's. Mm-hmm. But why are people gonna go to Nordstrom more? Experience customer service. The feel. Yeah. <laughs> How yeah. how they're going to be how they're going to be treated like they're a household name because of their customer service. Uh, I get to travel the world. I get I've stayed in every kind of hotel you can think of. I've been in a cabin. I've been at the Holiday Inn, Four Seasons, Ritz Carlton, Holiday Inn, Motel Six. You name it. At the end of the day, a pillow's a pillow. At the end of the day, sheets are sheets. Does they have a bed? You're going to sleep in it. Some are more comfortable, than, but but the biggest difference between, let's say, your nice Marriott hotel and the Ritz Carlton, isn't that the stuff is nicer? The people are nicer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the difference. Yeah. It, it it's and that doesn't cost us anything. That's the interesting thing about kindness. It doesn't. It doesn't actually cost more money. I didn't say that people at the Ritz Carlton. It's not like people checking you in are going, "Hey, can I massage your shoulders? You were having a long day. Hey, hey, take off your shoes. Let me rub your feet." No, they're not doing that. They're just. They're just nicer. <laughs> so I, I, there is a tie to this from this to your book level up in my mind. Yes, and, it, and there's this tie to where do people feel. Like my business is so unique and specific that the exceptions of people do not matter. Like, for example, I I was doing a a event here earlier this week and there's a gentleman that was sharing and he um, was a long tenured soccer coach, coached 20 some years, very successful. And then through COVID pivoted and now he's in the mortgage title business. And he shared that he, you know, he's struggling because he's like, I don't know how to make that transition because I don't know the industry. And I said to him, it's like, no, you don't have to like, that's your superpower is, is not being stuck in the, this is the way it's always been. I mean, I'll I'll share this with you. The audience knows this. My previous career as a nutritionist for dairy cows. I did that for 13 years. And my biggest mistake is I thought the customer was the cows. I was to take care of them and make sure that they were healthy and taken Mm -hmm. care of. 
I didn't understand in my ignorance and youth and you know exuberance that no, my real customer was however that farmer felt, whatever yeah. his employees felt. How did I make them feel? Yeah. And I think that's where, again, I, I have that perspective now. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. And yet I think what happens is when you get into that place and to use one of your mm -hmm. levels, you just start coasting, meaning, oh, this is just our business. This is the way it goes. This is just how we operate. And people just, they keep buying our product, so they'll just buy it. They're, they're yeah. almost, um, I, I heard a, a, an executive share when I was uh, at an event a couple of weeks ago. He works in um, HVAC, and he said, well, we have mm -hmm. captured clients, meaning we can do whatever. They're captured. They can't get out of our service. So we'll just yeah. charge them and take advantage of them. To me, that's, as you describe in your book, level, leveling up, coasting. I'm just mm -hmm. coasting. I'm just going to, eh, it's yeah. good enough. I'm I'll an autopilot. Yeah. yeah. So why do you think, I mean, and again, to tie into your book and all these different levels, but what perpetuates that mindset? Yeah. You know, I think we are naturally human beings that follow the herd. And so if we say, hey, here's your job, most people go, okay, great. As long as I'm doing my job, I get paid. Two plus two equals four. Most people are not waking up thinking to themselves, hmm, but what if I went the extra mile? Could we get six? And could we, could we multiply that? And oh, what if I woke up and didn't just do my job, but what if I helped somebody else do theirs really well? And like, what if, like, they don't think beyond the parameters they've been given, which is why most people work nine to five. They need to be told what to do and when it's time to go home. They don't have the ability to really think for themselves outside of that to go, wait a minute, I could take this thing to another level. And so that's actually why I wrote this book, because I sat with a lot of teams and I sat with a lot of executives who... They wouldn't say this out loud, but it's like they were waiting for somebody else to come and save them. They're waiting for somebody else to come and help them grow. And I'm like, well, why don't you help yourself grow? Here, here's what I've learned about leadership. Every organization I've ever worked with. And, and, and I, would, I would even be curious to even just hear your perspective of the organizations you've worked with and the leaders you've talked to. I know very few people who would say they work for an amazing leader. Like that they would go, my leader is amazing. And they just start bragging on and on and on about their leader. I've met very few people who say that, which means most of us, most people on the planet are going to be stuck with average, mediocre, bad to good leaders. But very few people are going to get that 10 out of 10. They're, they're absolutely awesome. So does that mean, I think every single person listening to this has to answer this question. Let's just say you have a mediocre leader. If you have a mediocre leader, does that mean that you have to live with mediocre results for the rest of your life? I it's a big don't question. think you do. I, I, don't, I don't, even if your leader isn't trying to grow, doesn't mean that you can't. I think if you want to grow, you will, mm -hmm. and you will put yourself in a position to do so. But if you're waiting for your leader to sign you up for the class or buy the book or do, or, or do, then yeah, you're going to stay where you are. But I, what this book is, it's giving people a permission slip to say, Hey, look, let's, there you go. That's let's take the word. this thing to another level. Whether people in the organization, because people love to, to, to blame the leader. They love to blame the organization. They love to blame the environment. Well, guess what? You are in the environment. So you playing a part of this sad story that you're telling everybody else. You were there. So in that regard, I think you've got to take ownership of your own career in life. And, and that's, that's what this book is all about. So there's a lot of thought swirling. I would agree to your point that um, I've had the pleasure to be around a couple people that I would say are pinnacle. But there's a reason why, you know, when, when Jim Collins wrote Good to Great, there's only 11. Of mm -hmm. the thousands and thousands and thousands of companies that he, you know, there's only 11. 
And, and I think that th- that happens. And yet I think we almost get stuck in the mm-hmm. perspective. Well, I can't be that. So uh, I'll just keep going. Right. It, it's this, you know, idea of yeah. your levels. I can't be a master. So I'll just be where I'm at. I'm just kind of and in the word that I, I kept thinking and then you, mm-hmm. you shared it was giving yourself or giving those that you lead permission. Yeah. And, and I even come back to the, what, you know, the, one of the very first things you opened with and, and talking about the, the speaker that you were just, you know, chatting with. And you yeah. said the difference between you and me is I'm willing to fail. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm, I'm willing to throw out stuff there that, uh, that didn't work. Yeah. And I think the difference there, and I think even from chasing failure, yeah. And what you said, and and I had the opportunity and, and prep for this, watch the documentary. We're going to dig into that because it all ties in here. Yeah. Is when you have permission, yeah. man, you'll do anything. Yeah. And, and there was one moment in documentary, which, you know, a lot of footage, right? It's a 15 minute short. There's a yeah. lot of footage, but there was one moment, one moment that made me come, step back and say, oh, what do you think that is? There's a lot of moments there. <laughs> I just so kind of want to look. There's quite a few moments that even made me go, what are we doing right now? All right, I'll bail you out. <laughs> it's when the camera pans to Jeff Hornacek, uh-huh. the then coach of the Phoenix Suns. Yeah. And, and you, as you're you know, narrating it, comment about how he and the other players start cheering for you. Yeah. And they were from, again, and, and tying this all together. Yeah. In that moment, they were giving you permission to fail, meaning go put in the work, do the effort. We're with you. We're not yeah. going to mock you. We're not going to laugh at you. Yeah. And the thought and the question that I wrote down hmm. when, when I saw that from Jeff, and let me pull up my notes here and read it, is the greatest coaches and leaders are always dot, dot, dot. And to me, I don't think Jeff could help himself mm. from doing what great leaders and coaches do. Yeah. And that's encourage. He couldn't yeah. help himself. If you watch it, he's pretty natural. He smile. He's like, yeah, right. Go. Come on. Yeah. That permission, that encouragement, that I'm going to speak belief in you yeah. is probably the greatest difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I think leaders, I think leaders have to be the chief encourager in their organization. Have to be. They have to be. And every leader has, has to have a high level of self-awareness, which is what chapter two is all about. Yeah. And one of the things that I think a self-aware person has is they're aware of their impact on others. They're aware of how their words and actions impact other people. And I think when a leader doesn't understand that, like the power of their words, there are certain people that I know are just like big fans of me. And I just know it. And I don't use that for my advantage. I use it for theirs. And so when I see them, I look them in the eyes and I encourage them. Why? Because I I know it means more. Because they see me as a leader. There's days where I don't see myself as a leader. I'm like, I don't know why you're following me. They're like, go follow this other guy. (laughs) But it's like, I know how, I'm aware of how you see me. And if I hold like that sacred place as a, as a person that inspires you, or even just a person that's just following me on social media, I was like, I just, I take it seriously. And I think, man, I, I understand how my words can impact people that I've yet to even meet. And I think that those things are, are important, but we've all worked for somebody that wasn't aware of how their words and actions impacted us. So I just don't want to be that kind of leader. One of the the pieces that I read today, it's kind of my Mm -hmm. journaling time and different topics. It's actually from Tim Elmore's book and and it's about being a mirror and being a window. Mm. And, And what I think is interesting here is you talk about words. I think that's, that's the window piece. Mm. But all of our actions, our body language, mm-hmm. how we carry ourselves in, in other interactions, that's the mere element. 
Mm. And this is one of the things that just hit me and struck me. A window you can see through, it, it, it's direct, right? Yeah. If I look in a mirror, I see a reflection of me, but it's different than what you see. Yeah. It, it's different, right? It's because it's, it's, it's mirrored. Like what I see is like if you look at your, you know, in a camera, right? And you don't click on the mirrored view, you get this, your, this look and you're like, oh, that person's ugly. Like, come on. They're just something's wrong, right? Because it's not the you that you're used to seeing. Yeah. And I realized that's self-awareness, mm. right? It, it, we can't be self-aware by looking in the mirror. It's just not possible because we're going to see reflection. Those are our intentions. Yeah. It's the window that others see that are actually, that's yeah. the real story. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't, it's, it's going to be very difficult to be self-aware without, without a good friend. Without somebody coming alongside you to go, hey, here's what I can see that you can't. Yeah. And ironically, the person that's been teaching me the most about self-awareness is my son. It's amazing yeah. how they do that. Yeah, like they starting to see how I am through his eyes. I think the moment for me that like, really struck me was we were playing soccer one time and I was sending an email at the same time. Ooh. Uh -huh. And he stopped kicking the ball and he walked over to me and closed my laptop. And he was four years old at the time. That was a moment for me where I was like, mm, you know, thinking about the question that I posed in the book, what's it like to be on the other side of you? Man, I thought in that moment, what is it like to be on the other side of me to have a multitasking father? Hmm, that must be awesome, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I also began to notice that every time I picked him up from school, I was on the phone. Because I'm sitting in this carpool lane yeah. and, you know, hey, call a buddy, call a client, whatever. Hey, how's it going? But I noticed like four or five days in a row, he'd get in and be like, hey, dad. And I'd go, wait, 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 wait. And then I, I just, and so I, I almost had to have the conversation with myself that he's not old enough to have, to be able to articulate what some of his needs are. But I just started thinking like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I may not be the funnest dad in the world for pickup line. And so like 305, when I pick up my son, I know it's like, hey, I got to be off the phone. Even if it's like, hey, I take a break from 305 to 315 on our ride home, it matters to him. Yeah. Like totally. that that time is is sacred. And it took me a little bit too long to see that. I, you make the mention. I agree that, you know, our, our kids are a, a great look into who we are. And sometimes yeah. it's a who we are that we don't want to accept. But yeah. in, in some ways we have to. Yeah. Because usually that who we are is the same with people that we work with. Oh, yeah. and, and maybe they don't have the, the ability to, you know, come over and shut your laptop. They don't have the ability to, you know, say something that makes you stop and think of like, oh, yeah. I'm not doing this right. Yeah. And yet we need that. We need that yeah. ability to, you know. Be real. And mm -hmm. so often I think it's, it's out of fear. It's out of, but if I don't do this, I can't mm -hmm. be the best for you. If I don't do this, then yeah. I can't care for you. And it's that insecurity that's like, oh, well, I have to. We start to make exception for it because the alternative is if we get it wrong, it, it's a mark against us as a person. Yeah. And yet we're, we're looking and saying, hmm. Is that a person I really want to be? Mm -hmm. Is that a person that I, I think is going to make a difference? Is, yeah. is that a person that coming back to that authenticness and that, that willing to be vulnerable to say, you know what? I, I probably get this wrong. Yeah. I, I accept it. I get it wrong. I'm sitting here saying I get this wrong. Yeah. I probably even, I think I got it wrong last night as I was talking to someone, my kids get home from school and, and um, yet 
it, it's always a sobering moment in realizing the impact. And if you do it long enough, mm. then all of a sudden you lose that integrity and it doesn't matter. You almost have to work twice as hard once you start working on yourself to cover yeah. all that up. But even working twice as hard shows the dedication and people are like, oh, he really does care. Yep. It really does matter. Yep. I, and I think, you know, the word you just used there is like, is one I, I try to teach and live as best as I possibly can. I think leadership is complicated. And at the same time, I think leadership is simple. Like, I think there are some very complicated decisions that leaders have to make. But in terms of like getting your people on board, it really comes down to caring. Like how well you can care will take you further than I believe even vision casting. Then it's like, oh, let me just, let me just, you know, I've, I've got this really great vision. You're just going to love. But it's like, man, when the chips are down and your people truly believe that you care, man, like it's, They'll, they'll run through a wall for you. Absolutely. But I think caring can, can do more for a team than, than money or promotions ever could. So I want to make sure I give you enough time here. It's been fun conversation. Like, great. Like, yeah. go down these little rabbit holes. That's what sure. I love about this stuff. Stuff that yeah. we're not getting out of your books. Your books are great, right? Don't get me wrong. Sure. But uh, <laughs> I want to give the opportunity here to yeah. say... Why are you most excited about writing leveling up and the, the impact that you foresee having on people? Yeah, man. I, I think that the biggest thing I'm, I'm excited about with this book is seeing people take ownership of their life. Mm -hmm. Seeing people get that light bulb to, um, in the book, I talk about the different uh, levels that we can live at. Most people live at a level where they're, uh, either they're stuck or they're just coasting. They're going through the motions. They have a job they tolerate. They have relationships that are mediocre. Um, some of the most wealthiest people I know in the world don't have five friends. They don't have five true friends that they could call and go, man, my marriage sucks. Like they don't have that. And so this book, I believe, is going to help people move from a place of coasting to a place of developing, thriving, the, the highest level is, is mastery. And that's where things are going so well in your life. You're helping other people do the same. And so I'm excited to see people take ownership of their own path and stop blaming <laughs> or giving that responsibility to somebody else. I have worked for some good leaders, some mediocre leaders, some bad leaders, but they're, they're not in charge of my career path. They're, they're not in control of my daily habits. They're not in control of my attitude and what I bring to the job. I have seen people with great attitudes at jobs most people tolerate. And I've seen C-suite executives who have the most coveted office in the skyscraper who are just always in a bad mood. Yet everybody wants their job. I'm like, oh, I don't know, maybe. I, it's ironic. I know people who are complaining that they're not having a higher position at a job where they don't even like the people there. So why do, why do you want to be in charge of all these people you hate? Doesn't make any, doesn't make any sense. And so, this book kind of pulls people back to go, well, man, what is my definition of success? And where am I going with my life? And what am I? And it's giving people back the keys a little bit to say, you know what? If, if there's something I want to do with my life, I can. That's what I'm excited about. I'm excited to see people go, man, maybe you get your dream job. Congrats. You probably won't. Let's be honest. There's just too many of us. Like, you probably won't have your dream job. But that doesn't mean that you can't grow. That doesn't mean you can't develop. That doesn't mean you can't treat people like they're a million bucks. It doesn't mean you can't serve people. It doesn't mean you can't add value to people's life. It doesn't mean that you can't, you can't grow in your skill sets. It doesn't mean you can't work on your craft. And so there is a growing, obviously, with the great resignation, 
there's this whole idea of like, I'm just going to go to greener grass. That ain't this book. This book is, how about you take care of the grass you got? Mm -hmm. It ain't even that greener on the other side. You left, they offered you. I can't, I can't tell you the amount of team members and executives I've talked to who jumped ship and were made all of these promises. And now they're over there and they're like, oh, this sucks. <laughs> man. I'm, I make more, but man, I, I, I guess I didn't, I guess I didn't think that, that they would ask me to work more. They, they said I could work from home, but, but then like that season ended and now, yeah, I, I can work from home, but, but I got to work 20 more hours than I was. You just thought they were just going to do that for free. <laughs> like, like you just, you just, you thought there were no strings attached because it was, again, it was, it was, it was greener grass. And so this book is more like, no, water the grass you got, like on your side of the fence, like give your best of that, make it green, show up and, and be awesome where you are. Cause you can be like that new job ain't going to make you a better person. Mm -hmm. That new job ain't going to make you a better leader. Like do what you need to do now to prepare for, for something else in the future. Totally. So, so that's what I'm excited I, about. I, I love that, you know, it's the one developing the, the self-leadership, which I think is the first step, right? You, you can't lead yeah. yourself, dude, you can't lead anyone else. Right. And I believe that, you know, that this idea, the wonder that I have and, and, you know, kind of dissect this a little bit, maybe take a minute or two is the, the pursuit of going up the levels. And as you know, you haven't described, you go from um, just the listeners here at the aimless to stuck to coasting, developing, thriving mastery. It's, I, I'm wondering where people get stuck the most and mm -hmm. or where they come back and actually stepping back is what's going to propel them forward. Because yeah. we talked about that and I, I think about, you, you just talked about that person, right? They left one job. They said, oh, I got to have a better leader somewhere else. 82% of people left during pandemic had that thought. And then they get there and realize, oh, it's the same muddy mess that I was in before, if not worse. And, yeah. and they went from maybe, you know, they were unstuck to coasting and now they're like, Oh, I'm stuck. Right. I'm stuck here. Like, yep. how does that going through all of that? Yeah. You know, I, I think I am, I'm an entrepreneur. So my way of thinking, I think like an owner. So I have to be self-led. I have to like, like we got to go. Cause if I don't mm -hmm. go, we won't go at all. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a fine dance working for somebody because you are trusting them or trying to with your, your job, your livelihood. So you're putting your, like, it's a very vulnerable position to be in. And so it's hard to create those boundaries. It's hard to, but I, I do sense a little bit of an entitlement in society right now of the mindset that a lot that I see a lot is this is what y'all owe me. This, this is what I deserve more than I see. Hey, here's the value I'm trying to add to my organization. Like here, here, here's what I want to, like, I want, I want to go above and beyond for this place. It's, it's more of a, let's stick it to the man, like more of a, well, where's my bonus and what's in it for me. And then people are shocked when they aren't promoted. <laughs> it's like, no, you help, you help enough, you help enough people in your organization climb the ladder. Who, who do you think they're going to say, man, we want to work. We want him on our team. We want her on our team. Why? Because you help yeah. other people like that. We all want to work for those people. We just don't always want to be those people. Mm -hmm. I encourage people to go, Hey, be, be that employee that you want to work next to. Mm -hmm. So go above and beyond for people. We all, we yeah. all want whoever we're working with to go above and beyond. Yeah. This book is going, you go <laughs> and, and do that. And then people will have those stories to tell about you. One last thing, 
So we, we talk a lot about self-leadership. You shared with me that uh, you're going to release a course yes. uh, about self-leadership. You want to talk about that real quick? Yeah, man. It was, it was so fun. We, uh, it's my very first course. It's called The Art of Self-Leadership. And essentially, I ran out of capacity to coach executives. And being a speaker first and speaking to all of these audiences, like we constantly had this like influx of like people wanting coaching. And so we have a roster of coaches that uh, we, we utilize to, to help our clients and whatnot. And then I thought, man, what if, what if I could sit across the table from somebody on demand that maybe can't afford my coaching prices or probably could never afford to bring me in to speak or whatever. And so we created this course that we just said, Hey, let, let's, let's take people through some six components that we think, um, if a person is really mastering these six components, like, man, we, we feel like they would be, they'd be in a place where they're leading themselves pretty well. Um, the first module is all about self-awareness and just man, locking, locking in on, on what that really, really, really looks like. And, and then we go through uh, relationships. We go through scheduling. Man, some of the most successful people I've met in the world, man, they are, they're not just meticulous about their money. They're meticulous about their time. Mm -hmm. And I, in our executive coaching practice, one of the first things we do is a calendar audit. So if you're sitting across from me, I'm going to say, hey, what'd you do this week? Oh, I, you know, I just, no, no, no. I want to see it. What'd you do this week? What did you like actually do? What'd you do this month? Your calendar is going to tell me everything I need yep. to know about where you're going. If it's not on yep. your calendar, you ain't going to win. So, yep. so that, that's what we kind of take people through and, and it's fun. So all of that can be found at ryanleak.com. Sweet. So, um, by the, when this airs leveling up, just released, uh, at the same point, the opportunity to check out the art of self-leadership. Ryan, yes. thanks so much, man. I appreciate Absolutely. this. It's, it's been fun to spend a little bit of time with you, get to know you. Um, Absolutely. Appreciate it, man. All right. Appreciate it, man. Two big things that I took away from that conversation with Ryan is not only talking about permission, this idea of, you know, you need permission, whether it's yourself, whether you get that externally to up level. To, to level up, to grow. I mean, that's a big facet of the Impact Driven Leadership Program, um, whether it's the round table, whether it's the book club, all of those things. We just got done a couple weeks ago with our first uh, Impact Driven Leader Workshop, the Awaken the Leader Within Workshop. Don't worry if you missed that. There will be an opportunity to have another one soon. Go to theimpactdrivenleader.com to make sure you reserve um, notification. I'll sound that notification well before that, those dates of that event, when that gets locked in, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, that will get locked in. It may be already in the airing of this episode, those dates locked in. So go to the impact driven leader.com for a free workshop where I kind of really break down in essence, the elements where I feel we need to give ourselves permission, permission to up level permission, to get better permission to build our self-awareness. Because I believe those are, are attributes that every leader needs to engage in thinking about. How can we be a agendalist? Ryan shared it. Doc Rivers is a speaker. He came in and he was agendalist. And I think that genuine vulnerability, in, and as Ryan displayed, here's my agenda. I want to serve people. Here's my agenda. This is where I think we can go. And I want you to be in it and with it. And not just about what am I going to gain? That was one of the, the absolute big areas that I had to identify and transform in my life is when people viewed it being all about me. And I had to come to grips with that. I had to quickly go a different direction and say, it's not about me. It is about how I can serve and help others accomplish more. That's in my heart as well. I appreciate you guys as we're wrapping up 2022 the guests like Ryan would not be possible if it wasn't li like listeners like you. And I'm so grateful and thankful that you choose to download and share and subscribe and just uh, allow me to have these tremendous conversations and bring value to you as well. Thank you for um, being a listener. I'd love it if you give me a review, a rating, subscribe, share it with others, watch on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel where you can also catch uh, the 
Facebook, the live that I do, the um, live segment, my coffee chat that I hold on Monday through Friday. You can catch that on YouTube or LinkedIn, also uh, on Facebook. Glad to be able to share those thoughts, those elements that I'm, I'm digging through, chewing through and learning from. So thanks for being here. I'll catch you next time.